Hello everybody, welcome back to my channel, The Francophile Reader, and welcome to everybody who's joining me in February in our read-along of Communal Luxury by Kristen Ross. I'm really excited to talk about this book. This is my first time reading it with you all, and I just wanted to first begin with some ground rules. The first, of course, being that I will not tolerate any nastiness. This is a book that deals with politics. And, you know, like anything, politics and religion are very, very controversial. And um, I think that we can have these conversations without insulting people. So I will not tolerate nastiness. The second thing I want to say is that I will always begin my videos with a summary of the sections for the week and particularly an emphasis on the arguments that Kristen Ross makes in her study and I want to ground my reflections in the arguments that the author makes. I really encourage you all to do that. Um, it's really easy for us you know, because we all have opinions about communism or anarchism or maybe you know something about the Paris Commune, you come in with some of that background or whatever. We have opinions. Um, and to talk about these opinions is, is fine, but I really ask you all to ground your opinions in the actual arguments of this book. Otherwise, there's no point in having a read-along, right? We want to be talking about the book. I want you guys to self-regulate, right? Uh, I, I, you know, I, I think it'll be great if everyone is just responding to each other's comments, uh, but maybe don't respond to comments where it's very clear that the person hasn't really read the book. I don't want to be censoring people's comments, but I think that it's kind of a waste of time to just come in with opinions without having actually worked through the arguments in this book. Okay, so that's what I will do. I will always begin with a summary um, and, and really focusing on the major arguments that Kristen Ross makes. It's also a good uh, practice, you know, if you're new to nonfiction and you want to know how uh, you should approach nonfiction or if you want to know how academics review academic books, I think hopefully this series of videos will help you learn that. That is all. Those are the ground rules. Pretty simple. Today we're going to be talking about the introduction and the first two chapters. For all of my Francophile friends, um, I just want to point out that this book was actually first published in French under the title L'Imaginaire de la Commune. It was published in 2015 by La Fabrique. This book is partially, so it is a history, okay, but it's an intellectual history. So what Kristen Ross is really emphasizing, as she, she says in, in the introduction, is not so much the particular events of the Paris Commune, but rather the mentality of the communard, the communard being the authors of the commune experiment. She wants to look at the ideas that shaped this project, and then it's afterlife, you know, what happened after the massacre. Um, the, the Paris Commune lasted for 72 days, beginning in on March 18th. It was, you know, only a little bit over um, two months, maybe two and a half months. But the survivors wrote a lot later, um, while they were refugees in England and Switzerland in particular. And um, the question is, you know, how did their experience as survivors of the Paris Commune influenced their later writings, what were their reflections on the event. There are passages in this book that come directly from the authors of the movement themselves. And so because of that, th this book assumes some background knowledge of the Paris Commune, which I didn't have because, like I said, I don't know anything about this event. So I turned to our good friend Wikipedia, which I believe is always a great place to begin for just a general introduction to a topic. Um, nowadays, Wikipedia is um, monitored, edited, written by scholars often. I, I know professors who contribute to Wikipedia. So it can be a very good place to begin for getting a general introduction to a topic. So this is what Wikipedia has to say. Basically, March 18th is identified as the beginning of the Paris Commune because it is on March 18th that the Radical National Guard fired on the French army, 
killing two soldiers. Now let's go back a little bit. The Paris Commune was a response to the end of the Franco-Prussian War. So the French lost the war, there was this armistice, and the French had to, there were, you know, all these stipulations, right? The French had to give up a lot of things. And one of the things, you know, has to do with the army. So the French could keep their army, but it was more of an independent institution. Uh, nevertheless, the president, his name was Adolphe Thiers, he was basically trying to maintain control over the army and therefore over these cannons. So there's these cannons of Montmartre, like the weapon, right? And the army was trying to claim it for the nation. Whereas the National Guard, which was much more radical, had created an alliance with local communities and was basically trying to claim these cannons for these local communities. So this is a conflict between the nation and these individual communities. So that is seen as like the beginning of the Paris Commune. Now the Paris Commune in very broadly is anarcho-communist um, and Kristen Ross kind of begins to tell us about what, you know, what this means. Uh, but basically the communards were opposed to the state. They believed that the state was evil, that the state was, you know, behind all of the oppression, also associated with capitalism, and that, you know, the Paris Commune experiment was an alternative to that. Instead of it being patriotic or, you know, focused on the French nation, uh, it was international. There were people from all over the world uh, that lived in Paris in these communes, and it, it, was, it was a different vision uh, than what France had adopted in 1789, right? 1789 being, of course, the beginning of the French Revolution, which led to the First Republic. The Franco-Prussian War had ended the Second Republic, and between the Second and the Third Republic, we have this Paris Commune experiment. Some of the values of the Communard were adopted by the Third Republic, but remember, that the communards and republicans have very, very different values. These are the values that this book discusses. So yeah, the reason also why this um, event in on, on March 18th is so important is because at one point in chapter one, Kristen Ross talks m mentions in passing Prosper Olivier Lisa Garret, who uh, was a historian who um, really focused on this event, the, the cannons dispute between the National Guard and the president and the army. Lisa Garret had collected the testimonies of the survivors and it is his study of um, the commune that has really shaped historiography. Kristen Ross is critical of you know his, his focus on the March 18th event. Because, you know, what he does basically is create division between what came before. There are a lot of different anarchist meetings. Kristen Ross finds these meetings to be very important. Whereas Lisa Garret says, well, actually, these, these, these events were really passive. There was nothing active that occurred. Whereas on March 18th, there's actually, like, something active that occurs. Um, and that the National Guard firing on the French army, killing two soldiers that event is really the beginning of the, the commune experiment. Um, Kristen Ross really wants to move back a little bit and say, no, actually, while the Franco-Prussian War was going on, there were already these kind of anarchist meetings um, and that the Paris Commune was really kind of just the fruition of all of these discussions. Another thing that characterizes the, the, the introduction and actually the first two chapters are these dualities. I've kind of mentioned one already, dualities between, you know, the state and this universalism that the communard preached. But there's also citizen versus patriot, right? Citizen of the world versus a patriot of France. French Revolution, which was considered bourgeois because it was statist, and the Paris Commune, which was anti-statist, iconoclastic, and this, what, what Kristen Ross calls a working class internationalism. The communards have this really somewhat romantic view of the Middle Ages. They often refer to the communes as this revitalized medieval structure. It's not completely the same thing because the medieval structures were, um, as they say, chauvinistic, they were 
um, you know, women didn't have any rights, they were like controlled by the church, they were religious, whereas the commune are anti-religious, or at least they really f emphasize secular education. They talk about these medieval communities as, as at least being models where they're small, they're not, you know, controlled by a state. And so there's this kind of romantic medieval vision that underpins the communards ideology. Kristen Ross talks about um, Thiers, which I, I mentioned Thiers as, as the president of France after the uh, Franco-Prussian War. He was an ally with the Versailles, the Versailles being like the conservatives. Um, now, the Versailles don't really get much of a voice, at least in these chapters. We're told that they are the bourgeois, they're the statists, they're the ones who want to eliminate the anarchists. And they're kind of, you know, they're presented as the villains. Um, I think it's very clear that Christina Ross admires the communards. We'll see if she has anything critical to say about them, but so far she's been quite positive about, um, you know, the, the commune experiment. It was um, Marxists, and, and particularly Marxists in Russia, who influenced the Paris commune the most. And many of them were geographers, which I thought was particularly interesting to see how many scientists and, and geographers were authors of the commune experiment. There are three major figures that are mentioned. There's Elisée Reclus, William Morris, and Peter Kropotkin. Uh, Elise Reclus in particular distinguishes between a universal republicanism and a republican universalism. And again, here's another duality. A universal republicanism is what the commune stands for, which is that there, there is no, it, we're not talking about a re, like a national republic. We're talking about these communities that are international, that transcend national boundaries, where, where national boundaries just are abolished. And Republican Universalism is this civilizing mission where there's this image of uh, republicanism that is then transferred to other countries. It's um, empire, it's colonization, it's the Third Republic. So even while certain values like the creche, which is daycare, the communards were pro-daycare, or, you know, secular education, the communards were, as I said, opposed to religious education. These, you know, while these were adopted by the Third Republic following the massacre, they're very different because the Third Republic is ultimately patriotic, it's ultimately nationalistic. This is not at all what the communards were about. And Kristen Ross really points that out, so that, you know, when we ignore the complexities or the nuances of the uh, communard philosophy, you know, we can come to think that the Third Republic is just really a fulfillment of the vision that people like Elise Reclus had, when in fact they're vastly different projects. And then in chapter two, there's a lot of talk about the education. So the education is secular. Um, there's a mention of Jacoteau. So uh, Jacoteau was, uh, one of these thinkers who influenced, um, I believe, William Morris, who was one of the communards, he, he tried to downplay the, um, the importance of having a teacher, claiming that everything is in everything. He claimed that if you just picked up a book and started anywhere, you could eventually teach yourself. And in teaching yourself, you would be emancipated. This is the quote from a book, from the book. Jacoteau's methods attacked the underlying principles of French republicanism as it was being consolidated at the time. A pedagogical vision of politics underwrites all of French republicanism from the end of the 18th century through its consolidation after the demise of the commune in the Third Republic. There's that. There's also that art as artisanal. So instead of having this division between, you know, the bourgeois intellectuals who do art and then the laborer there was a blending of the two in the communes. So you would have, you know, cobblers who would also write poetry. And what the cobblers were doing was, was perceived and, and valued as art. So the quote, all art in their view was artisanal and skilled in its production 
and in the socialization of its makers. That is communal luxury. Communal luxury, another duality, communal luxury is contrasted with luxury. Luxury is all about class, it's all about hierarchy, it's all about the bourgeois versus the proletariat, whereas communal luxury is everyone being able to participate in art, everyone participating in labor and owning the means of production. Now, personal kind of response to this. First of all, I wanna say that I think it's great that she's focusing on intellectual history. I study intellectual history. So it's nice to see, um, you know, that this book is focusing on uh, the authors of, of this movement and how they understood their involvement in it. Um, I think that Jacques Coteau's book, The Ignorant Master, is really worth reading. Um, it's, it's not Jacques Coteau's book, it's uh, Jacques Rancière, who's a modern philosopher, who wrote about Jacques Coteau's teaching method and promotes it. That's actually worth reading if you want to understand how he viewed education. I wonder how different it is from, un, I think it's called unschooling, it's like a, it's basically, well I guess it's an educational program where Parents don't really teach their children, they, they have their children kind of decide what they're interested in and pursue that. I wonder how different that is. I will put it in the description. The one thing though that I disagree with is Kristen Ross's just over-enthusiasm for the Paris Commune. She hasn't really been critical of anything they have said so far. And at one point, um, I think it's in chapter one or chapter two, she contrasts the communards uh, vision of education, particularly Jacques Coteau's method, with modern France's response to um, Muslim girls wearing the hijab in school, uh, which is often referred to as the headscarf controversy. And I don't exactly see why the communard would be supportive of girls wearing the hijab, seeing how anti-religious they were and how iconoclastic they were with respect to religion. Anyway, um, I'm hoping that she's a little bit more critical, but I, I'm really, you know, I'm finding it very readable. I find it a really interesting history because these are um, issues that we're still discussing today, so it's very, very relevant. Um, but also it makes me think about how these issues are discussed in our current national politics versus how the communards would have wanted to discuss them, which is not at all on a national scale because they were anti-nation. So yeah, let me know what you uh, thought about these sections. Um, once again, try to ground your reflections in the text itself. Feel free to begin halfway through February. That's perfectly fine. This is a short book. It should take you only a couple days to read it. I will be responding to as many comments as I can. It doesn't matter, you know, whether it's in some of the older videos or the newest videos. I hope that you guys are enjoying this read-along. Thank you everybody for watching. I'll talk to you later. Bye now.